Welcome gestir, dear guests. Um, welcome to this open seminar on defense and security in the Arctic. This seminar is hosted by Warberg, the Association of Western Cooperation and International Affairs, in cooperation with Institute of International Affairs in the University of Iceland. This is a part of a seminar series uh, on defense and security in the Arctic that we are going to have this winter. But before uh, we start, I'd like to give the floor to Pia uh, Hanson, the director of Institute of International Affairs. Yeah. Thank you, Xavier. I'm pushing. I should have stood here. Um, good to see you all. It almost feels like back to normalcy, except you're all wearing masks. <laughs> But I'm still very happy to see you. We recognize the uh, eyes, <laughs> if nothing else. This is, of course, a collaborative project between Wartberg and the Institute of International Affairs. And I think it comes at a very opportune time. I think that a focus now on security and defense issues in the Arctic is something we should really be uh, uh, working towards. And this is going to be a seminar series that we're hosting this year with the collaboration of quite a few other uh, embassies here in Reykjavik. So we have the Canadian ones today. In March, we will, for example, be collaborating with the Norwegian embassy. And there are quite a few others uh, lined up as well. Uh, we appreciate the uh, opportunity to work with Wartberg, of course. We've done that in the past. But this is certainly, uh, like I said before, a very interesting time to be looking at these issues. So we look forward to it, and we hope that we'll see you all for the whole seminar series. David, over to you. Thank you. Can I also welcome here Njall Trusti Friperson, the parliamentarian who is, who is the chair of Warberg and, and also the chair of Icelandic delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Dear guests, uh, actually I didn't know that I was supposed to speak in, in English, so, but uh, we'll work on that. Uh, I'm just happy that we have opportunity to talk about this issue here, and of course try to talk more about uh, internal, international affairs concerning uh, security and, and defense in, uh, in our place and in the, in the North Atlantic and in the high north. Uh, what I think is very uh, interesting here is that uh, we know that NORAD has been uh, a system that has been working, I think, since about 1960 or so, and uh, and they start to renew it in the, in the next years and work on some uh, replacement of the system. So I think it's very important to have a, a, a Dr. James Ferguson here to uh, talk to us about this and tell us what's happening and uh, distinguished uh, uh, expert from Canada on those issues and I also think it's uh, when we're working on in the NATO PA at Parliamentary Assembly we also noticed that uh, new weaponry and, and uh, missiles and things like, like that, fast missiles maybe Mach 8 and, and things that so things are uh, changing very fast so I think it's very interesting to to hear what what and, and uh, about with the lecture what's what's going on and uh, uh, I think this will be a bigger and bigger subject in the next years concerning uh, the high north and of course Iceland is a part of that. So uh, I'm very, very interesting and also it's very nice to see you all and actually see people again in, in meetings. So uh, and hopefully we can have some more meetings this winter about those issues. And I think it's also very important for us to get some uh, perspectives from more countries in, in the North Atlantic and in the northern part. Of the hemisphere and so I'm very interesting and uh, uh, I'm sure we will all uh, yeah be quite interested in this issue and, and uh, thank you for coming to Iceland for, for a short visit I think it's 36 hours that uh, Dr. James will stay here and Ferguson will stay here in Iceland so thank you <laughs> thank you Niotl and Pia our guest here today is James Ferguson. He is the Deputy Director of Center of Defense and Security Studies at the University of Manitoba in Canada. In his talks, uh, Dr. Ferguson will discuss security and defense issues in the Arctic with a special emphasis 
on the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD. He is a professor in political studies at the University of Manitoba, where he teaches a wide range of courses in international relations, foreign and defense policy, as well as strategic studies. He has published numerous articles on strategic studies, non-proliferation and arms control, the defense industry and the Canadian foreign and defense policy. In addition to his academic publications, Dr. Ferguson has been commissioned to write several reports for the Department of National Defense and Department of Foreign Affairs. He also lectures a wide range of uh, military audience, including the Canadian Forces uh, Barker College. The Center for Defense and Security Studies is a center of national excellence in Canada with a mission to advance knowledge and debate on defense and security issues. One of their main research themes in security and defense is the Arctic and North America. This seminar will be held in English and is recorded. Hopefully we will be able to publish in our media platforms next week and, and the social media <coughs> and, and so on. After F uh, Ferguson lecture, we will open up for questions and comments. So Dr. Ferguson, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Just in case you get worried, the coughing you're gonna hear from me has nothing to do with COVID. I've been COVID tests so much in the last several days that uh, that world is nice, healthy. I have sinus issues, so, uh, so don't worry. But usually I'm okay once I start talking. Uh, and it's unfortunate that I can only stay for 36 hours. I'd like to have stayed longer. This is my first visit to Iceland. Uh, but unfortunately, the demands of teaching, I have to get back. Exams start very shortly and students are annoying me, if I can put it that way. So my talk today, I, I don't know where the PowerPoint is, how it comes up. For... It's the same one, just push to the next one. Ah, there we go, voila. Computers don't like me, I don't like them. Uh, in fact, I'm somewhat of a Luddite, if you know the meaning of that term when it comes to technology. Anyway, so my talk today is North American Defense Cooperation, NORAD, and the Arctic and the Northwest Atlantic approaches. Uh, I thought I'd begin by giving you an idea before I give you the overview, an idea of the depth and breadth of Canada-US defense relations in general. Uh, and in North America in particular. And it goes back to about 25 years ago when I was a young academic and I annoyed a lot of policy officers in the Department of National Defense about things. And I found out that the Assistant Deputy Minister for Policy in National Defense had commissioned in the Directorate of Western Hemispheric Policy a study to track and collate and identify the depth and breadth of the Canadian U.S. defense relationship. The project lasted less than two months when the director informed the assistant deputy minister that they were giving up. It was impossible to track this. At the time they gave up, they were able to, to identify roughly 50 executive level agreements between the two governments, over 250 to 300 memorandums of understanding on cooperation between Canada and the United States, both at the Defense Department's levels and with the military, and over 500 odd exchange programs, committees, et cetera, et cetera. And that was, in their view, only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it is a deep relationship, a long-standing relationship, which I'll give you a bit of a background to before I turn to the question of the Arctic and the Northwest Atlantic approaches. Uh, that is unparalleled in defense relations between two sovereign states. Uh, and I think that's important to understand. And it's also one that the Canadian public is by and large unaware of, or I may put it another way, uninterested in. Uh, and that sort of goes back to our mandate to try to raise public knowledge and debate on issues surrounding defense. The second point I wanted to make to start uh, I think it's an interesting one, and it sort of surrounds the argument I'm going to put to you today. 
That argument is simply, since World War II, and the establishment by the Treaty of Washington of NATO and Iceland's membership, Iceland has always looked east to Europe and continues to look east to Europe. The world has changed. The geostrategic environment and the geopolitical environment has changed dramatically. This is not a change brought about by the end of the Cold War, but brought about by the political situation which emerged in 2014 and 15, particularly concerning Russia. And I put China aside for the moment because it has a different sort of issue related to Canada-US defense cooperation in North America. Uh, the point I'm trying to make, it is time for Iceland to turn west and start to think about improving or developing more detailed relations, or at least have a better understanding of the developments that are occurring in North American defense, because they have direct implications for Iceland and its defense and security as the world unfolds in the next several years. The point to sort of illustrate this was last winter spring, uh, when a Canadian mobile radar detachment, Air Force detachment, from Bagotville, which is one of the Canada's two fighter bases just northeast of Quebec City, deployed to Iceland as a gap filler. Iceland's radars were being upgraded. Some of you look like with puzzled face. You didn't know this. That's good. Iceland's radars were being upgraded, and Canada deployed this mobile radar site as a gap filler until the radars were upgraded, and then the Canadian unit, under what they called Operation Illumination, went home. Uh, the information of this comes out of the NATO, out of NATO, a NATO report and press release, uh, which is available online if you want to read it, at least from the Canadian perspective, because I think the Canadians wrote the press release on this. Uh, and of course, one would easily come to the conclusion this is this was a NATO thing. Now, I won't raise the question right now. Perhaps we can talk a bit about it in the question and answer is about NATO, or you really mean the United States with NATO? on side, and Canada is a function of Canada-US defense relations. Bagotville, and the reason I raise this is Bagotville, as I said, is one of Canada's two fighter interceptor bases, uh, but it is also a NORAD base. Now, NORAD doesn't have bases per se, but at Bagotville, part of Canada's annual commitment of fighters to NORAD command resides in Bagotville. The other resides in Cold Lake, which is in northern Alberta. So although you might think it's NATO, there is a sort of a sneaky little NORAD element here. And I sort of wonder if that's a harbinger of future developments uh, relative to the point I wanted to make to you about uh, uh, the need to start to look west rather than east. And that's the point I will try to bring home today. Uh, so what I thought I would do is give you a brief, and I think it's useful to have a big background of how we got to where we are today with regards to NORAD. Uh, put the political cons, talk a bit about NORAD, its structure, its command and control, uh, because if Iceland does start to engage NORAD or North American defense in a more active way, I think these are important things that I think you need to understand about how this works. Modernization, the new threat environment, uh, how Greenland and Iceland fix, fit into this, or what I call the Greenland-Iceland nexus, and finally issues related to NORAD, NATO, and particularly the United States Unified Command Plan. The Unified Command Plan, as many of you probably know, is, is examined every two years uh, in the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, and it basically deals with how to separate or divide up the world, if you will, and of course, we talk about, Canada likes to talk about NATO. Iceland, I believe, talks about NATO. The United States talks about US, European command. And of course, that's understandable given the way the American structure is and how American internal Defense Department politics work. So let me begin with a bit of talk about the evolution of Canada-US defense cooperation and NORAD. And the first point I want to make to you deep back in history is one I think that is very relevant uh, for Iceland. And thinking about Iceland over the past several months and talking to some people here today, it keeps striking me how similar we two are, even though we are much bigger, we have a much larger population. But in political terms, and particularly in terms of the United States, 
we carry a lot of similarities. The roots of Canada-US defense cooperation date back to 1938. And it was at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, President Roosevelt invited to obtain a honorary degree, to be given an honorary degree, in his speech, unsolicited, and to the great surprise of all the officials there, stated basically, the United States would not stand idly by if Canada was attacked by a third party, which was in simple terms, a unilateral defense guarantee to Canada. Of course, this created some consternation in Ottawa and followed by Prime Minister Mackenzie King replying by stating, Canada would not allow itself to be used by a third party to threaten the United States. And it's those two simple statements, commitments on the part of the two, which set the political foundation and has, have never been, <coughs> excuse me, have never been revoked by any subsequent president or prime minister. And for Iceland, you in a way, if when I get down towards the end of the talk, what I hope to try to make clear to you for Iceland, in a way you're in a similar situation because of real estate, where you live in the world, under the new geostrategic environment. Iceland cannot be used, and the United States will not stand idly by if anyone attempts to use Iceland as a place to threaten the United States. And that's a political reality that isn't going to go away. And I think that's a very important consideration that one needs to keep in the back of their mind. To briefly go on further, quickly, in 1940, in the, with World War II on, but the United States are neutral, Canada and the United States signed a one-page Augensburg Agreement, which established the Permanent Joint Board of Defense. And that Permanent Joint Board of Defense meets twice a year. Lately, it's been only once a year, uh, and is still in place. The purpose of the Permanent Joint Board of Defense was to write reports, to undertake recommendations for, for Canadian-American def defense cooperation. And it was out of PJBD that air defense cooperation was started, and NORAD would eventually fall out. Uh, the value of PJBD, particularly in the war and still to this day, is that it is a political arrangement between the two parties. It is co-chaired by a Canadian and American, but most importantly, the Canadian and American are appointed by the President and the Prime Minister, respectively. They have unique direct access to cut across bureaucratic obstacles and barriers to go directly to the senior decision maker, the political authority, for action. And this has been one of the key factors over time which drove Canada-US defense cooperation forward. <coughs> in 1946, this was uh, added to with the establishment of the Military Cooperation Committee. Uh, this was high-level military functional experts attached to PJBD who dealt with the technical issues as this all unfolded over the many decades that were to follow. Uh, <coughs> As you probably are aware, uh, the foundation of air defense cooperation in Canada and U.S. relations in North America was the emergence of the Cold War politically and the Soviet long-range bomber threat that emerged in the early 1950s married to uh, nuclear weapons. And this would lead to a set of bilateral agreements and most importantly, a funding arrangement that would set the foundation for functional cooperation and for the establishment of NORAD as a binational command. What you see in front of you is the, dis, is the early warning lines that were built in Canada in the 1950s. The distance early warning line, which of course cuts across and where now is the North Warning System, the Mid-Canada line, and the Pine Tree line. Uh, funding for this was based upon an agreement that the United States would fund two-thirds of the costs of these very expensive, given the Arctic environment, and particularly for the dew line, uh, infrastructure, and Canada would pay for one-third of the costs. Uh, in specific terms, the United States built the dew line, the United States built the pine tree line, and Canada built the mid-Canada mid line. And this cost-sharing arrangement has been one of the foundations of Canada-US defense cooperation in the air defense, now we call it the aerospace defense environment, 
uh, that continues to this day, as I will talk about shortly. From the initial stages of bilateral cooperation between the United States Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force, this then evolved into a recognition that it made a lot of sense to create a permanent command structure. And this was driven from the military levels upwards, from the Air Forces upwards, and would lead in, lead in 1957 to the establishment of the North American Air Defense Command uh, operationally. There's, you, get, you get easily get confused over this because it was operationally established in October, but the formal political executive agreement between the two countries was not signed till May 1958, attended, of course, by political issues over sovereignty in Canada in particular. <coughs> that established the two primary missions of NORAD, uh, air early warning or air warning, and air control or air defense, uh, and the foundations of the agreement, which would then go through renewal processes, initially 10 years, then regularly pretty well after that every five years, but every now and then for political reasons in Canada, it would be shortened to two years. Uh, and this would continue until 2006. In 2006, NORAD would be renewed in perpetuity. Although both Canada and the United States do have the right on a three-year basis to request an opening of the agreement, uh, in the absence of such a request from either party, uh, there is no renewal process anymore. NORAD, as, as we like to call it, is now in forever or at least until some dramatic changes occur uh, in the geostrategic, geopolitical world. Uh, following that, in about 1964-65, when the United States began to deploy its early warning infrared satellites for ballistic missile purposes, uh, ballistic missile early warning, uh, that mission would then be assigned to NORAD as well. So NORAD does air warning and, spa and space warning or ballistic missile early warning, and of course, this is where the origins of the term aerospace come from. Importantly, Canada does not do aerospace control. The terms of reference says aerospace control. It really just does air control or air defense. Canada did not agree, and there's a debate between Canada and the United States, who invited, if anyone invited anyone for a long time now, but still to this day, Canada's policy is not to participate in the American Ballistic Missile Defense Program. Uh, particularly in its one major ground-based system in Fort Greeley, Alaska. Uh, although NORAD provides the early warning data for the B B U.S. ballistic missile defense mission. And one of the interesting things, despite this anomaly in the relationship, which is important to understand the nature of the relationship between Canada and the United States in this area, and elsewhere as well, is that the impact of Canada saying no had no appreciable effect whatsoever. The United States just went about its business, we went about our business, and it's not been, even though people talk about being an irritant, it hasn't been an irritant in the relationship. Although things have changed, as I will point out late, later. Uh, if you jump forward, the next major event in the evolution of NORAD occurred in 2002 when the United States stood up U.S. Northern Command uh, on the basis of uh, the Unified Command Plan, as agreed to by the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, at the time. Uh, it was the first solely dedicated U.S. combatant command uh, for North America. Uh, it created a bit of an issue for Canada uh, because U.S. NORTHCOM, as its acronym goes, uh, is responsible for the maritime and land defense of North America, uh, pardon me, of the United States. I never said North America. Don't, can, Canadians would get very upset if they heard me say that. Of the United, continental United States, including Alaska. The air side of the equation is a NORAD relationship, is NORAD's responsibility. And one of the issues that quickly emerged was this would potentially create an image that NORAD had slipped under a US-only command. And part of the political issue surrounding this was to ensure that they were portrayed or understood as separate commands, separate and equal commands. And this would lead birth to what's known as the tri-command relationship, which is the relationship between US Northern Command, NORAD, and Canadian Joint Operations Command in Ottawa. Despite the political symbolic side of this, 
NORAD and U.S. North CARM are basically integrated. Uh, at Colorado Springs, at Peterson Air Force Base, uh, the NORAD and U.S. North CARM Command Center is fully integrated. Uh, there are Canadians who at times appear to be doing U.S. NORTHCOM things and Americans who are doing Canadian things, and I'll talk a bit more about the depth of this binational relationship uh, in a bit more detail. <coughs> uh, but it's fully integrated. It's a fully integrated. There are exceptions. So, for example, you get pictures online of the command center, the operational center in Colorado Springs, and there's one desk which is U.S. only. And that's the ballistic missile defense desk because it is a NORTHCOM mission, not a NORAD mission. Uh, but by and large, the, there are Canadians and Americans intermingled throughout, not just the headquarters, but as I will point out, in the regional structures of the command uh, that exists to this day. Uh, <coughs> Finally, in 2006, as I said, NORAD was renewed in perpetuity. And in addition, NORAD acquired a new mission, Maritime Warning. Uh, I'm not going to say much about the Maritime Warning mission. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting thing. It's a very complicated thing how it all works. But, and the, certainly the politics between the navies and the NORAD people uh, over what NORAD should or should not be doing in Maritime Warning. And the fear among the navies that this was a first step to the integration of maritime control into NORAD. And this would go back to Rumsfeld's first proposal to Canada, which was in the wake of 9-11, Canada and the United States should establish a North American Defense Command, integrated land, sea, air, and space. Canada said no to it. And that's part of the reasons why we sort of gave on maritime warning. So that gives you sort of a basic history of how this is involved. And if you want more details, I'll happy you uh, <coughs> provide them. This I wanted to look at is the current North American radar coverage. In the 1970s and 80s, in the 1970s, the United States and Canada both recognized that uh, the existing three radar lines were both obsolete and out of date relative to the changing threat environment. That threat environment was occasioned by the development of air launch cruise missiles. The net result was that the Mid-Canada Line and the Pine Tree Line were dismantled. The dew line was dismantled and replaced by what is known as the North Warning System, which runs from Alaska through Canada. The northern Canada reaches down Labrador. Uh, it consists of mostly short-range canned radars and a few long-range radars, and that gives you an idea of the coverage of these radars, which is really important in terms of what is about to come. And that gives you also an idea of the other coverage coastal coverage and over the horizon backscatter radar, those are all American uh, capabilities. Although there are Canadians via NORAD which are posted to these places as well. Uh, and that speaks to this sort of intermingling of the Canada-US. Uh, so it's, it's one of the views that you get and you learn from the people uh, who end up in Cheyenne Mountain, pardon me, that was the old command of course, in Colorado Springs, is that there's three views of the world. There's NORAD, which is a North American view, there's Ottawa, which is a Canadian view, and there's Washington, which is an American view. And NORAD likes to think of itself as the only institution in the relationship which thinks North America and acts in terms of North America as an integrated whole. And that's important to understand, uh, and particularly if you start to think about how this relates to the political relationship between Canada and the United States, and the lack of attention in Canada that's paid to NORAD and this defense relationship. So I'll get back to this in a, in a minute. I have a, another slide of this. To put the political in context, the commander of NORAD is dual-hatted as the commander of US Northern Command. And he and the future, he and she report directly either to the prime minister through the uh, chairman, pardon me, through the chief of the defense staff in Canada, or report directly to the secretary of defense in the United States. Uh, so you have a high-level commander of two commands with direct access to the senior political decision-making in the United States. Uh, by virtue of the 58 Agreement, and in all the subsequent agreements, Canada and the United States agreed that the commander and deputy commander of NORAD 
cannot be from the same country. It didn't specify which country, but the net result or reality, which is not surprising given the disparity in our capabilities, uh, was that the commander of NORAD has always been an American and the deputy commander of NORAD has always been a Canadian. And then you work your way down deeper into the structure in Colorado Springs and you find Americans, Canadians doing similar jobs all over the place. Uh, and it speaks to this binational nature of this command. The National Command authorities, authorities every year, as I mentioned, devote specific resources, fighter interceptors, uh, to the NORAD command. These come under direct command of NORAD itself uh, and technically cannot be transferred out of NORAD or except with senior political authority. They are NORAD assets. Uh, the rest of the thing that's important to understand about this is, and I think relevant potentially for Iceland, is that uh, NORAD doesn't own any of this. So if I go back, let me go back for a second, can I go back? This infrastructure up here, the North Warning System, that is not NORAD. It supports NORAD. It's Canadian. And similarly, when you look at the infrastructure in the United States, it's American, but it supports NORAD. And that's the point in point that NORAD is a supported command by national assets, which provide key information to NORAD uh, in order to execute its missions. The political context of NORAD, as noted here, is reflected also in the regional command structures, or the command structures underneath. With NORAD headquarters, geez, this didn't work out very well. Anyways, there are three regional commands in NORAD. Alaska Regional Command, which should be over here, in Anchorage at Elmendorf Richardson Air Force Base. Continental Regional Command, which is in Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. And Canada Regional Command, which is in Winnipeg, where I come from. Uh, in addition, in Canada, there is North Bay, which is the East Reg Regional sub-headquarters of Canar and NORAD. The United States also has under CONAR, SEADS doesn't exist anymore. The, what this is up here in Rome, New York, is the Eastern Air Defense Sector Command. That was the command that was in charge of the response to 9-11. And the Western Air Defense uh, Command, which is located in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, what's important about these commands is they are all blended. The commander of Canada region is a Canadian. The deputy commander is an American. The commander of Alaska Regional Command and the commander of Continental Regional Command are Americans. The deputies are Canadians. And although Americans dominate, of course, Alaska and Continental, Canada personnel dominate Canada, there are a significant number of other the other states' representatives, military representatives, in those two command, in all these commands. So they are very blended commands. And this is part of this idea or belief that how officers with national backgrounds come to acquire a binational sense or a North American sense of the world. Uh, and I think it's important because, of course, once they finish their tour of a duty with NORAD, wherever that may be, uh, they go back into national command structures. But the legacy of NORAD in North America doesn't go away, at least in my view, at least in talking to the, a lot of the officers who've served there and then moved back into commands in, in Canada, the United States, and then retired uh, from the military. Uh, Canada also, just so you know, I didn't put this up very well. If you look at the Canadian U.S. Ballistic Missile Early Warning Network, which is three radars across the north, Filingdales in the United Kingdom, Thule in Greenland, which is a really important site nowadays in clear Alaska, as well as two in the three in the continental United States. Uh, Beale Air Force Base air uh, radar system, radar in Beale, California, phase array radar in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and finally a phase array radar in Cavalier, North Dakota, which is about 60 miles south of Winnipeg. Uh, those are all blended with Canadians at them. Uh, and you, you get, I hope you get an idea of the depth of the relationship between the two. Uh, the nature of, finally, the nature of the command structure, how this all works. Basically, the commander of NORAD 
which has the assets for air defense uh, dedicated to it, uh, provides what is known as air tasking orders. So out of all the resources that are tasked to his or her command, in the case of a crisis, or in the case, the worst case of the outbreak of war or a direct threat to North America, it's that he or she is the person that decides who gets what resources. But the actual execution of the air defense plan, command of the actual attack or defense itself, then falls to the regional commands themselves. Now, this has become a contemporary issue in NORAD about command and control, but I'll, I'll just put that aside for now. But that gives you an idea how even with a binational clam, command, there is still this national flavor that has not entirely gone away in the relationship. But as I said, it's a very close relationship between the two countries, and certainly NORAD is considered the symbolic institutional reflection of Canada-US defense relations as a whole. Uh, that its importance uh, cannot be underestimated in terms of the threats to North America. Uh, <clears throat> let me turn to North American air defense and NORAD modernization, which is currently underway, at least in words. Uh, the fundamental uh, foundation of modernization, particularly from Canada's perspective, which is focused on the North Warning System, is two simple realities. The first is the radars of the system up here are all reaching the end of their life. Uh, they have to be replaced or at least overhauled to ensure that they continue to work. This deadline, sort of the drop dead date, is 2025 uh, for replacing this or modernizing it or whatever term you want to use. Uh, Canada, in a sense, because there's issues surrounding our actual, how this is going to play itself out, uh, Canada uh, is now spending money to try to extend their life to 2035. Uh, but it's difficult to know how that will play itself out. The reason that exists is because the only money, money we marked last year in the Canadian defense budget for NORAD, for the North Warning System, was $80 million, which is not very much money at all in the bigger scheme of things. <coughs> so something has to be done. The other problem politically is this. This is the Canadian and American air defense identification zones. Prior to 2018, Canada's air defense identification zone excluded that part of Canada. And as a result, when Canada said it was going to modernize its air defense identification zone, it, needs to, it decided it will expand them to cover all of the Canadian Arctic ar archipelago. The problem was the radars can't look out that far. They're just incapable of doing so. So you have end of life and functional problems in terms of coverage for Canadian sovereignty terms. And of course, this partially reflects the greater attention Canada began to play particularly under the Harper government, towards the Arctic and reflected in its Arctic Northern strategy. Uh, so that's sort of the foundation of, for Canada at least, North Warning System modernization. But there's more to this than that. But just to put a background in this, the first meeting, and to give you an idea that this has become a priority for Canada and the United States, the first meeting between virtual meeting, I think it was virtual, no, it was the first in-person meeting, pardon me. I, to forget about these things. The first meeting between President Trump and Prime Minister Trudeau in the communique that followed, both pledged themselves, identified the fundamental importance of NORAD and North American defense cooperation, and pledged themselves to NORAD modernization. Shortly thereafter, Canada released its defense white paper, uh, the Trudeau government's white paper called Strong, Secure, and Engage. And again, it emphasized North American defense modernization and NORAD modernization and North Warning System modernization. But the key point here, there was no money attached to it. And it remains the case there's no real money attached yet. And I'll try to explain that later on. And just to update you even further, the first virtual meeting between President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau once again in the communicated and announced the priority of North American defense modernization and NORAD modernization. Uh, 
And that sort of sets the political context that this has become a priority, although many in Canada at the senior levels have doubts about whether the Americans will follow through with the priority, but certainly at the political level, <coughs> and I can talk more about exactly the reasons behind that, uh, this is a key issue. But the real issue, notwithstanding the air identification zones, expansion or enlargement to cover Canada, and the obsolescence of the radars themselves, is that the new threat environment that NORD and North American Defense faces requires an entire overhaul and rethinking of the North warning system. Ground-based radars will not suffice to deal with the new and threatened environment. And this threat environment is a product of two things. One, politically, uh, the, what I'll call simply the adversarial relationship with Moscow, and the other, technologically. And this is the development of new generations of long-range air launch and sea launch cruise missiles. Apparent de developments by the Russians of nuclear-powered cruise missiles, supersonic cruise missiles, and hypersonic glide vehicles. All of these, given the existing radar system in the north and its location, cannot be tracked. In other words, there is a major hole in North American defense, in its aerospace defense. And this creates the foundation for what has to be a major overhaul. Uh, there are a lot of ideas that are in the public domain. I don't have access to the classified world. Uh, so where the real state of thinking is. <clears throat> but the general view is what is needed potentially is larger radars in the Arctic which has significant implications. These are big backscatter, over the horizon backscatter and phased ray radars. Uh, these are big, big pieces of build, big, big buildings. They have to go into the Arctic, which is extremely costly, which is a difficult environment to work in, uh, and even more problematic with climate change and the melting of the permafrost. In addition, of course, this has major implications in terms of, of the local indigenous communities who in the past, with the North Warning System and the earlier dew lines, etc., Government of Canada and National Defense simply ignored them. Uh, they didn't consult with them, they didn't bother with them. Well, that no, is not going to work anymore. And so well, there's a variety of issues there. Uh, that are going to be at play to make this a very difficult job uh, politically, and particularly in terms of the court's rulings about consultation with the indigenous community. This has got to be undertaken. And it's been started, I understand, in a very limited fashion. There's also a major environmental problem. When they shut down the dew line, they basically just locked the doors and walked away and let it rot. You don't get to do that anymore. Uh, you have to clean it up. Uh, and that raises issues, a variety of issues, including funding questions. Uh, the North Warning System and the modernization of the North Warning System of NORD, or what I prefer to call the North American Warning System, uh, is to be funded on a 60-40 basis. The United States will pay for 60% of supporting infrastructure in Canada, and Canada will pay for 40%. Uh, and please note, Canada pays nothing for NORAD supported infrastructure in the United States. We pay not a thing, except for our personnel costs. Uh, so this is the arrangement, but whether that covers environmental cleanup, if you go back to the American closing of bases in Newfoundland uh, and other places, the Americans basically told Canada, go away. It's your problem now. You pay for it. And this, of course, raises big questions and burdens on the defense budget. But to go back to my point about the new threat environment, uh, the ability to respond to this new threat environment requires not simply big, large ground-based radars, potentially. It may require an expansion or availability of American airborne radar systems, the airborne warning control uh, aircraft, which can do this job. Potentially, naval systems might be involved as Canada Navy starts to become more involved in the Arctic as a function of global warming, and of course, satellite-based systems. 
And these in turn all have to be integrated into what people call a system of systems. And then structured around advanced artificial intelligence, computer systems, etc., to enable to exploit the system. <coughs> all because you're not tracking bombers anymore. You're tracking cruise missiles in flight. So although the terms of reference for NORAD will not change, I would point out, it's really no longer an air traditional air defense mission. It's now a cruise missile defense and hypersonic missile defense mission, which creates a lot of conceptual issues and political potential political problems in Canada in particular with regards to uh, how does this fit in with our policy on no to ballistic missile defense in the United States. <clears throat> the pr simple problem is cruise missiles have difficult time being tracked by radar because they have such a low front cross section to be seen. And the only way you can really track them is either over the horizon by bouncing and looking down or from systems above that can look down. And this requires, as I said, a systems of systems, massive costs into uh, investments into modernize, and moreover, moreover, not just the modernization of this, the North Warning System, which is here again, but the modernization of the entire structure of NORAD and North American Defense Cooperation, because it does fully start to engage the maritime sector. So this overview, overhead simply shows you a rough idea of the new generation of cruise missiles. The ability in the new developing one to be able to launch from Russia itself, airplanes over Russia, or certainly over the Arctic Ocean to strike at targets in North America. These extend further if you go this way, in paths coming down between Iceland and Greenland. And this is the current long range of a submarine launch ballistic missile, but that is likely to start to extend up further north into here, simply because of this new technology. In addition, hypersonic glide vehicles, is what the Russians have developed, uh, can maneuver in suborbital space, reach speeds at roughly 50 to 80 miles above us, reach speeds of anywhere between Mach 5 and Mach 8, which may, makes it a very daunting challenge particularly because they're maneuverable. But first, before you can deal with the problem, you've got to be able to inter identify them. And this is the key thing, is this gap that exists that is central to North American defense modernization and brings Greenland and Iceland into play. This is, as you know, the famous Gaiak Gap, which usually now has an N attached to it to Norway as well. This is an overview from NORAD of the flight paths, potentially of air launch plat bomber platforms with air launch cruise missiles. And this is the ranges they provided of these. And you notice our radar lines are limited down here. And you now have to stretch these out as far as you can. And you have to stretch them out, not just here, but you also now have to stretch them out over here in order to provide advanced early warning and then make decisions with regards to intercepting them. And that is one of the reasons why Greenland, and which is talked about, not a lot in Canada, but certainly at the military level, it's talked about in NORAD, is becoming more and more important to North American defense requirements. And it is also the reason why this will also turn to look at Iceland. And that is reinforced in this context. Uh, I'm not sure if I had this slide. No. In this context, by the new world of defense and deterrence. What I'm driving at is if you think of the traditional NORAD area of responsibilities, of operational responsibility, uh, it was strictly narrow, North America defined narrowly. It was all here. This was not North America. Strange. That was all Europe. And that's, of course, reflected in the American command structure. U.S. NORTHCOM goes this way. U.S. European command goes that way. But this new defense and deterrence environment requires, in my view, 
a major rethink. The importance, the geostrategic importance of Iceland during the Cold War, and it's and, and this is putting aside the political and cultural factors in Iceland and in Greenland, which turned them east towards Europe. But the strategic, geostrategic was, the gap was vitally important as it means to protect the sea lines of communication. In basically what I call the legacy of World War II, the expectation of war. And although I talk about war all the time, you have to be, understand that war, you have to think of these two things in terms of how war ha might happen and what it would look like in order to understand what investments you need to make, what postures you need to take, take to create a credible and effective deterrent to the outbreak of war. So you think about how the war plays out, and today when we think about potential war in Europe, with us involved as a function of our NATO relationship, uh, we think in terms of Eastern Europe, of events along the Baltics. The Baltics usually are the number one hit list. Potential issues of what implications if things extremely go bad in Ukraine. And it's from there one then imagines uh, what you might need to do. And the conclusion of keeping this in European command is, well, we're going to do what we did in the past. <coughs> we're going to send over, we're going to mobilize and send over North American resources and personnel uh, to prosecute the war. And as long as we can demonstrate to the Russians today that we will be able to do this and defend this, uh, they have no hope of victory. The costs of going from crisis to violence is too high and relative to the benefits of a war, and thus they will be deterred. The fundamental flaw in that thinking is this is not World War II anymore. This is not the Cold War anymore. There is no mobilization base. No Western country has any mobilization plans whatsoever. We can't gear up industry as we did in World War II and in the stages of the Cold War. When you took car manufacturers like Ford and GM and in very quick succession turned from building cars to building tanks and military trucks, or the massive shipbuilding industries that existed prior to World War II that could be transferred very quickly to build combat vessels, as well as the commercial to the military aircraft industries. That doesn't happen anymore. Modern advanced military equipment takes months and months and months to build. They build them one at a time. There's no great assembly lines anymore. There's nothing to transform. And moreover, you can't simply mobilize young men and women today into the armed forces. It's a high-tech world. You can't simply give a young person a rifle, train them for a couple months and ship them off. You now have advanced computer systems, technologies that required different educated, different skills, and a much longer time to train. In other words, and this, this affects not only Canada and the United States and, the Europe, and Europe, but it also affects the Russians, and increasingly will start to affect the Chinese as well. In other words, war is come as you are. It won't last very long once the missiles start to fly. So the importance is not on planning a sea lines of communication, because that takes too long to move stuff, to create stuff, and then move it. The importance now becomes another aspect, and that is the threats that Russia could pose and the future China could pose to North America, and the need to develop a credible deterrent posture in North America to deter not only attacks against North America, but as a foundation of deterring a war in Europe. That the so Russians cannot calculate that by threatening North America or doing something to North America, that they can win, nor can they calculate that in a crisis by threatening North America or us lacking a credible deterrence posture that Canada and the United States will fold up its dip diplomatic tent and give in because of fear. So this is the pressures of the new strategic environment which exists. 
And in this environment, if you go back to this point, Iceland is a vital strategic piece of real estate. In terms of these threat lines here and others that run over Greenland and in here, in this area, Iceland has, is a fundamentally important base place for advanced surveillance reconnaissance radars uh, at a minimum that would need or should be then integrated into NORAD, which is responsible for North American air defense. But for the time being, of course, as long as this exists, NORTHCOM NORAD here, US UCOM here, and just to note, the other problem is Alaska. Alaska is divided between NORTHCOM, NORAD, and uh, Indo-PACOM, Indian Pacific Command, uh, which is a problem for that part of the world. As long as you think of that way, when the planners and commanders think, the planners and commanders here thinking about this, think about this requirement. They're not thinking this. And there's always been a major issue in what was known as, this is known as a command scene that can be exploited because where the two commands meet, exactly where that operation occurs becomes difficult to know. If you think then of this important to this, as I think is what is emerging now relative to the threat environment, then Iceland and certainly Greenland need to start to engage with North American defense and NORAD, which may be even more fundamentally important to Iceland's and Greenland's defense and security than Europe is, as it has been in the past. To reflect this, one of the ongoing studies that NORAD has undertaken and continues to undertake is future basic requirements. Uh, what type of forward oper operating locations are needed in order to ensure uh, that there will be assets to defend and then deter the Russians in the case of a crisis uh, between the two sides. Uh, the Americans, Canon is involved as well, if I know or add, are looking back to old bases in, where is Newfoundland? In Newfoundland and Labrador that were shot long ago. They're looking at further northern bases up here. There are two, by the way, there are two forward operating locations right now in Canada for NORAD. One is Inuvit in Northwest Territories, basically on the Arctic Ocean, and the other one is Iqaluit, which is in the Eastern Arctic in Nunavut. Nunavut. Uh, they're looking at bases, further bases up here. They're looking at issues surrounding the Greenland, former Greenland bases of the United States and as you already all know, Keklovik is open again, and there will be increasing interest from the United States with regards to probably expanding its presence. Whether that presence should be bilateral under the NATO umbrella, which I don't think it should be, but rather mixed with NORAD as part of the air defense component uh, is an important uh, issue that's going to emerge. And I'm sure there are already discussions going on. Uh, this is all gets compounded further when we start to think about global climate warming, climate change, the opening of the Arctic passages, and I haven't talked a lot about the uh, Arctic, <coughs> but what those maritime implications are uh, for uh, the defense of North America and the defense and economic security of North America in case of a crisis. Uh, the Arctic and the Northwest Atlantic approaches. The Arctic was always important for NORAD because that was the path of Russian Soviet bombers. The North Atlantic approaches are now becoming increasingly important to NORAD uh, because of the changed technological environment and is informed by the political environment. So that sort of is in a nutshell. And there's a lot of other issues I can talk about that are related to this. This is gonna cost money. It's gonna cost billions and billions of dollars. Uh, how will it all work itself out? It's difficult to know. What will happen with the United States Unified Command Plan? We can talk a lot about NORAD, we can talk a lot about NATO, but the real issue is where the United States will go with the Unified Command Plan. And there is enough rumblings within the Pentagon and within some of the services that the current structure is out of date. When you have Strategic Command and US Air Force Global Strike 
capabilities, which doesn't see the world in regional commands anymore, but sees the world as an integrated whole with integrated capabilities. These all have major implications about thinking about where the United States might go. And will pressures emerge, and they're already starting to sort of rumble beneath the surface, that this has got to be moved that way. Where you would locate it, it's difficult to know. But it's likely that the seam is going to move, probably maybe split Iceland in two, but possibly cut through east of Iceland, which would put you in an entirely different political defense situation if Northern Command moves out there. And of course, this then raises the issue about the relationship between NATO and NORAD and North American defense. Canada and the United States are signatories of the Treaty of Washington of 1949. We are bound by Article 5 of the NATO agreement. But from the moment that was signed in the context of the emerging air defense cooperation between Canada and the United States, and even though the PJBD was labeled by NATO as the Canada-US Regional Planning Group, the reality was North America is for North America, period. NATO is Europe, and that logic or thinking has really not changed. You know, some people argue, but whether this will lead to potentially a rethink about the NORAD-NATO relationship, and I would point out here the Great Britain has started to rethink this. They now have a permanent liaison officer posted to uh, Colorado Springs, nominally, formally to, as a liaison to U.S. Northern Command, but he's also there because of NORAD. And there are staff talks that are held regularly now between the UK and uh, NORAD Northcom. So the UK is starting to shift and there are political reasons and other factors that drive this as well. The question is, at least at a minimum, and I'll conclude here, I don't know how long I've gone, I could go longer, but I'll conclude here with a simple point. I'm not trying to tell you Iceland has to become North American in its thinking, in its mind. But at a minimum, Iceland better start to think about and find out what's going on in North American defense and security. Because it will have implications for you. And if this environment shifts the way I think it is, and if you see as NATO has shifted, and one of the problems of NATO is that you've got multiple defense and security mindsets. The Baltics, the East Europeans have their problems with the Russians. Italy, Spain, Greece have other problems relative to NATO. Norway's got a different set of problems, somewhat closer to us, with regards to the Russians. The French and the British, well, they have different political thinking about the role of NATO relative to the EU. NATO is divided. That's why it works on consensus, the lowest common denominator. And it's been successful, and don't get me wrong. But this is now looking at a relationship or dealing with the relationship of the United States and Canada, which is not, is very divided at all. In fact, there's pretty much commonality that's going on and how this will work out. Now, on a positive note, I would add to conclude here that in a recent NATO Arctic study report that came out, done by the academic, well, not entirely academic, but academics were on it, for the first time in the history of NATO, NORAD got a mention about the NORAD relationship. I think it was one or two sentences. Does that mean anything? I don't know. The reason I don't know or I'm dubious outside being an academic and academics are always cynical about things. The reason I'm dubious is because uh, a close colleague of mine sat on the committee that wrote it and was specifically responsible for putting NORAD in. Uh, so, who knows? But that, I hope, gives you a broad overview of North American defense cooperation, some of the issues that are confronting modernization of the command and North American defense, pressures for maritime warning, which will merge into maritime control, uh, potentially, uh, as people look for more efficient allocation of resources as resources remain constrained and shrink, particularly in the post-COVID-19 environment, uh, looking for those efficiencies. Uh, 
this to me is a step, and my colleague uh, and I, who just finished a book that will be published next year on NORAD in perpetuity and beyond, argue that inevitably there will be an integrated North American Defense Command. It's just a matter of time. Because the same forces that drove the creation of NORAD, functional logic and efficiency, will drive this further and further down the rope. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, or comments uh, for whatever time we have left, which I have no idea what, how much time we have left. Thank you. I can sit down. So thank you, Ferguson. Uh, I promise to have offer like a few questions and comments. And unfortunately, we we had a bit over time, and oh, uh, oh, according to our schedule. To me. I would shut up. So if if there are any questions or comments. Let me answer this two ways. First, the archer and the arrows, just to be clear. And this is language which you get out of NORAD and U.S. North Command, and not just them, but very American. And it came particularly out of uh, Admiral Gortney when he was appointed commander of NORTHCOM NORAD. He talked about we shouldn't be dealing with arrows, we should be striking at the launch platforms, the archers. And that is something you, we've heard, I've heard repeatedly. There's a real problem for NORAD and a problem for the Canadian government. Uh, and a problem that then falls into the American lap as well. Given the long-range launch systems you have, middle of the Arctic, the Russian Arctic Ocean, Russia itself, and if you think, and this partially will answer your second part, potential launch points that don't run north-south, but run maneuverable potentially down the gap between Greenland and Iceland over Greenland, running down there if there's gaps somewhere. Uh, if you want to do what the archers, what you're talking about effectively is establishing a preemptive posture. Uh, the U.S. does that, and that is Strategic Command and U.S. Air Force Global's Prompt Global Strike Command. If we're in a crisis and we feel things will go bad, the U.S., and this is also reflected in U.S. Maritime Naval Strategy, which has been adopted by NATO. Uh, basically, we will go up north and strike first to take them all out. Uh, that has real political problems. It's also got very strategic problems for strategic stability, if you take that, such an aggressive posture. Uh, so we are left to deal with the arrows. And you are correct, because one of the other issues which I didn't mention uh, that are, is under consideration is point defense. Uh, in uh, NORAD's annual exercises, which are known as Exercise Vigilant Shield, in 2017, as part of the exercise, which usually has a war scenario and other crises built into it, uh, the U.S. seconded to NORAD uh, an Army Air National uh, Army National Guard Air Defense Unit from South Carolina, and it was sent up to North Bay, Ontario. That's a point defense capability, land-based point defense. Uh, and there's issues about, to go back to the 50s again, that that's what you need. You need a layered defense system, which will include point defenses at key strategic sites. One of the funny things about the South Carolina detachment was they got into Canada all right, but their equipment got stuck at the customs border. Uh, so there are always problems in the relationship. Uh, <clears throat> if you think in it that way, and you think about that northwest, the Arctic to the northwest Atlantic approaches, well, you might be right that Iceland is not that significant in terms of point defense unless you want to be defend yourself because you are a target. I mean, you may not like to hear this, but simply because you took a position, for example, of neutrality or not in alignment, that Russians will go, oh, we're not going to bother with Iceland. Oh, no, they're going to bother because of strategic, geostrategic relevance. So that's a national decision. Uh, but this, yes, you're, what we're talking about is that that's why the basing studies are for air-based interception, modern aircraft, and the new the F-35, for example, the F-22, uh, whatever system we buy, which has been delayed again, uh, will have look-down, shoot-down capabilities, so they can look down and, 
and track the cruise missiles, but there's everything's always leaks. And it's similar if you talk about submarine surface. Launches that are now gonna take place further and further away from the continent. So you're left with that scenario problem. Uh, and if the 50s and 60s example is anything to go by, uh, decisions about interception capabilities and point defenses will be national, although they will be assigned to NORAD. But it won't because that will be infrastructure built on national territory. It will be national infrastructure. So that's a decision both nations, all the nations would have to make. Do we want these things or not? Uh, Iceland, if I understood you correctly, finding Iceland in terms of that requirement of defense, active defense, is not that significant, I think, to the real defense of North America. Its surveillance capabilities and location is what makes it very, very significant to the defense of North America. You got an hour? <laughs> no, no, sorry. It, you know, I don't necessarily agree, disagree with you. It is, in a way, in our imagination. Uh, it relates to functional organizational inputs into the way middle ranking to senior ranking officials see the world and what they identify as important as not important. So the general argument you make is, do they have intent? And what are their capabilities? The military, and you're right in a way, my military colleagues would probably want to kill me if they heard me saying this, but I've told it to them. You mind the way the military sees capabilities. It's what capabilities my opponent has tells me what I need to do. Intent, in a way, is not my problem. Intent is a diplomatic political problem. And this, of course, gets into big issues about civil military relations. Uh, but of course, what they will say to you right now, and there's a truth to it, is that we have a relation, to, adversarial relationship with Moscow. Put the Chinese aside for now with Moscow, where there's a potential clash of arms. I don't know, it was a month or so ago, I, seen, I think it was the Secretary of State in the United States said something about sort of willing to defend Ukraine from a, from a Russian invasion. And that, what stunned me when I heard, you're not gonna make that commitment because that's a bad, un incredible commitment. You're not gonna do nothing with Ukraine because there's not much you can do because you have, you're right about the background. So, from the NORAD North American defense, and it's important to remember in the case of North American defense, the driver has always been the military, dealing on functional grounds and what they see the problem of capabilities and how to meet them to support the deterrent of the national and the global deterrent or whatever you want to talk about. Uh, so you can explain this, and that's what my uh, presentation is. This is what's driving this, because American and Canadian political elites don't pay a great de deal of attention to North American defense. They all want to go overseas. And they think, we have to stop the threats over there before they get here. The problem with that thinking is they, you cannot divide those up because they're interlinked with one another in terms of your current credibility. But the final point I would make to you <coughs> is you hit on one really big problem. All this talk has taken nuclear weapons off the table. Because in the Cold War by the 60s with the development of ICBMs in particular and submarine launch ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads, NORAD's real function was not air defense at all. It was to provide enough early warning for the President of the United States to be able to order a retaliatory strike before the Soviet warheads hit their targets. It was all nuclear. Now nuclear weapons seem to have been lost in this equation. And I've raised this question with officials. They have no answer for, for me. Cruise missiles are dual capable. They can be nuclear or conventional. So I've asked the senior, senior military people, okay, you got a cruise missile coming at you. What are you gonna assume it is? Well, if I'm assuming, I'd say it's nuclear, and that means I'm gonna go. Well, no, not necessarily, it could be conventional. Yeah, it could be conventional, 
But we don't know. We don't know. Where are nuclear weapons in this relationship? Is all this investment, you're, and you're right, I think, in some ways to think, is all this investment worth it when you're sitting, in the case of the United States, with it in the process of modernizing its strategic nuclear forces? How does this play out in the complicated deterrent relationship? Now, I could take you down other paths, <coughs> but it's, it's difficult. I put this, it's merit in all the different perspectives on this. But it, I sort of end up in the, the conclusion is, and maybe it's because I hang around too much with military people, is worst case. What's the worst case that could go wrong here? And if maybe if we can deal with the worst case, and the worst case is a threat that emerges in a relationship where conventional issues are really what is assumed to be at play. That nuclear weapons only deter nuclear weapons. And they're sort of in your back pocket. Okay, two quick answers to you. One, because I'm a Canadian and NORAD is about defense, for me, consider and examine Russian radar capabilities implies that we are, have offensive designs. I need to know what they can do. I can't, I don't know. I just never really looked. I look, I keep trying to keep track of Russia, but I've never really looked at their radar uh, capabilities. Uh, I would assume they are fairly well developed in the Arctic region, uh, simply because uh, the Russians have invested a lot of money to reopen bases and expand their military bases in presence in the Russian Arctic. The, Ru the Russian Arctic area is a vital driver of the Russian economy, resource-based economy. Uh, it's a great strategic significance, which then creates the argument, if we threaten that, that will be a useful deterrent, but now you get into other stability things. Uh, my hunch is they're pretty advanced capabilities, because they're going to deal, they're doing the same problem that we're dealing with. Not Canada, but the United States has developed long-range capabilities. They're developing hypersonic uh, scramjet capabilities. They're working along this path. They don't... They, it just stuns me when they talk about being surprised all the time about what Russians and Chinese do. Don't be surprised. They're not surprised. Makes good politics, though. So that's the answer to that. Uh, the Arctic Council, under no circumstances, two answers, under no circumstances, and my college, Dr. Andrew Sharon, who knows a lot more about this than I do, in fact, she briefs me all the time on it, uh, is going to enter in the security military world. Nor should it, because that will take it down a very dangerous politicized path more politicized than it already is. That being said, there are fundamental strategic and current and political reasons why Canada and the United States, potentially Iceland, Greenmark, Greenland, and Norway, should actually sit down with Russian military authorities at a military to military level to discuss what we used to call confidence building measures and communicate in an arms, not arms control, but sort of arms control way, communicate to each other what they know about each other back and forth. Because I'm not one of those who is of the view that the Arctic in and of itself is a separate threat environment. It's an avenue to North America. It's an avenue to Russia. Uh, but militarizing it, the decision after Crimea and Ukraine when we broke off, when the United States particularly broke off all discussions with the Russian military, and particularly over the Arctic, that I think is a grave political mistake. And these need to be reinstituted. It doesn't have to be at high levels, but this is something because we, Russia, Canada in particular, and the United States, I know this may be heresy, share common interests in the Arctic. That's a place where we do, can cooperate with the Russians. Stop folding this into this global war environment. Crimea, Eastern Europe is a problem. We'll deal with you there, but not the Arctic. We don't have to have a problem over this, and let's not get into that problem. At least that's my personal views on that. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, this concludes the first uh, open seminar in this, in this uh, series on, on securities and defense in the, in the Arctic. Uh, we are planning to have the next meeting in January, um, and, uh, January and February and so on. Uh, I'd like to thank Ferguson for your lecture. I'd also like to thank the Embassy of Canada and, and, and uh, the Icelandic Embassy in Ottawa and, and the Foreign Ministry. 
Uh, this meeting is concluded. Thank you.